Happy New Year. Welcome to the January edition of Black Nouveau. I'm Joanne Williams. There is a new sheriff in town, but before he gets sworn in next week, he'll join us to talk about his priorities. We're going to visit the Milwaukee Art Museum's San Quentin Project, Nigel Poor and the men of San Quentin State Prison. And we'll bid a fond farewell to a longtime member of the Black Nouveau family. We begin with our January tradition of presenting one of the student winners of the annual Martin Luther King Jr. speech writing contest. Some of you may ask, why is she clapping? To answer your question, I'm clapping to commemorate the 35 year long legacy celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In fact, it's a reason for us all to be clapping. Hello, my name is Amelia Bell. I am in the ninth grade and I attend Rufus King High School. In 1983, exactly 35 years ago, President Ronald Reagan designated the third Monday of January to be a federal holiday honoring Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Did you know that Atlanta, Georgia and Milwaukee, Wisconsin are the only cities to celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. for the past 35 years, stated by Fox 6 News. I think Wisconsin does it better. Let's just take a moment to really think about how King has contributed to our nation and how he has helped us reach to our goal of getting to the promised land and reaching the mountaintop. According to the Seattle Times, the promised land was where you did not have to march for your dignity. It was where you did not have to sing for your freedom. It was where there was no need for speeches to verify your humanity. The promised land was that sacred place where all of God's children would stand as equals on level, fertile ground. According to Dr. King, the promised land is a place we will reach someday. But after 35 years of celebration, and after 35 years of action, such as movements, hashtags, and protests, we have not yet made it to the place that Dr. King said we would arrive. In 2018, I still see people living on the streets of Milwaukee, right down the road. I still see parents unable to provide for their children because of the lack of resources. I still see Milwaukee Public Schools dropout rate rise and funding lowered. Last year, the theme for this contest was take a stand for truth and justice. I talked about juvenile car thefts and the negative effects it had on the community followed by their slap on the wrist. In 2016, the theme was we shall overcome. I discussed the poverty, racism, and violence weaknesses in our community. Back in 2016, nine-year-old Zelaya Jenkins was shot by a stray bullet while sitting in her own home one day before her 10th birthday. And yet, in 2018, I saw a 13-year-old girl who participated in this writing contest shot by a stray bullet that pierced through her window, a situation that just happened a few weeks ago, a situation that is sore to the community. A situation that seems all too familiar. Gunshots, police lights, news reporters, and yellow tape every single night. Yes, it's been 35 years of celebration, but we are still seeing the same problems that King consistently preached, marched, and prayed about. Parents, imagine telling your child goodnight, followed by a kiss and a see you in the morning but the morning of having your child present at the breakfast table never happened. You heard the gunshot, a familiar sound to you. You think nothing of it until your child comes in your room and like Sandra Park said, mama, I'm shot. May Sandra Parks and Zelaya Jenkins both rest in peace. This infuriates me, we have to do better. Dr. Martin Luther King died for our freedom, we have to do better. Every year, there are thousands of MPS students who put their hard work into speaking for change. We have to do better. Yes, we have come so far, but as King said, there is still a great deal of positive work to do. We have to do better. 
Congratulations on 35 years of celebrating the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and 35 years more to make it to the promised land by all saying together, we have to do better. Thank you. So Amelia, you've won this contest how many times? Eight times. Eight times? Yes. Boy, you've been writing since you were in kindergarten. Right. <laughs> <laughs> when did you start? In second grade. In second grade. Yes. Why do you why do you do you like to write? Apparently you do. Yes, I do. I love writing towards themes that, you know, involve my opinion and me figuring out what needs to happen in the community when involving change. So you said we must do better. That's how you ended your essay. Yes. Uh are you optimistic then we, that we can do better? Yes, I think that we definitely can do better. I think that as long as we are, have one goal as a community, then we definitely can do better. As long as we put forth the effort to have one end result, then we definitely can do better. Now, you're just a freshman in high school. Uh, what do you see in your future for four years from now when you go to college? What do you have in mind? Well, I want to go to an HBCU, and I want to, I haven't decided yet what I want to be when I grow up, but I definitely do want to go to college, and I want to go to an HBCU. It's something that's different from what I'm used to. Do you uh, participate in any kind of activities here in Milwaukee besides going to school? Um, I do cheer with my school, um, and I also swim. And then outside of school, I participate in this organization called the Roar Club, which is a partnership with Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated. And we also do different things in the community as well. And we, we feed the homeless, you know, we rake elders' um, lawn in the fall. We do different things in the community that I enjoy. And you enjoy writing too. You're going to yes, be doing definitely. any more? Yes, I'm definitely going to do more. I'm going to, you know, try to find something else outside of the speech contest so I can t continue my writing flow and not just participate in the speech contest, but, you know, other writing opportunities that may be in Milwaukee or even, you know, the country. Well, we'll look for other things that you write in the future, <laughs> and we'll follow you and see what you do four years from now. Thank you very much for coming on Black Nouveau. Thank you. Just because you're in prison doesn't mean that you shouldn't have intellectual and emotional and creative challenges. That's the theory behind the San Quentin Project, Nigel Poor and the Men of San Quentin. It is currently on display at the Milwaukee Art Museum through March 20th. Nigel Poor is an artist, photographer, and teacher. In 2011, she volunteered to teach a history of photography course at the prison. San Quentin now is a medium security prison. It used to be a maximum security prison. So it's a, a, a lot of the men that are housed there are people who have done a lot of time. And over the years they've been incarcerated, they've worked their numbers down so they're able to be at a, at a level two prison. So many of the guys are lifers or serving very long sentences. I went in with a lot of assumptions that everybody has, that it was gonna be a scary, violent, unpleasant place to be and I was, educated very quickly that it was as complicated and as fascinating as any other place you can find yourself. I found out that under difficult circumstances people find a way to flourish and to grow and to change their perspectives and, and to want to carry on and to not be disheartened by all the difficult things that come their way and that's, I mean, that's incredibly in inspiring. While she was teaching the course she came across an amazing discovery. And while I was doing that, I happened to be introduced to an amazing archive of negatives taken and housed at the prison approximately between 1930 and 1986. And so I've been going through those, scanning them, archiving them, trying to make sense of them, and then again working with a group of men inside the prison, having them really explain what's happening in the photograph. Because as an outsider, somebody who's never been incarcerated, there's obviously no way for me to ever know exactly what it's like in prison, no matter how much time I spend there. So this is the opportunity for the men to be able to educate me and to educate people on the outside. The pictures and inmates' comments are part of the exhibit. There is also a listening hey, station. Here you can hear excerpts from a podcast and that grew out of the writings. And learning more so the podcast is called Ear Hustle. And we're in our third season now, and it's a podcast that tells the everyday stories of life inside prison, told from the perspective of those who are living it. And it's co-hosted by myself and Erlon Woods, who's serving a 31-year-to-life um, sentence for attempted second-degree robbery. I want to know what it's like to be in prison. You really think people want to know what it's like in prison? Hell, Hell yeah, of course. Do. 
You got all these TV shows, new programs, like uh, Prison Break. Orange is the new black, locked up. You won't let me out. Man, you know all the shows. But they all bullshit, though. Why? Why are they bullshit? Is it ain't none I'm serving time. They ain't never did no real time. They acting. Yeah, and in prison ain't really like that. No, I man, we just living life. Like everybody else. The museum staff feels that the exhibit is timely and has significance for Wisconsin. I think it's really important for museums to consider issues that are relevant to their communities. And in Wisconsin, we um, both locally and nationally really have been talking a lot about criminal justice reform. So to me, doing an exhibition that was a platform for conversations within the community about these issues seemed important at this time. Working with various community partners, the museum has sponsored a number of events around the exhibit. It will hold its final event a gallery talk at the museum on Tuesday, January 29th. Nigel hopes that people who view the exhibit will understand that incarcerated people are still people. One of the things I want to say about this exhibit is I don't want people to come to it thinking it's going to be so depressing and heavy. Um, there's a lot of joy and beauty and light touch in all of it, but particularly in the podcast. Um, I think it allows people to really become alive and present and heard um, and complicated. The last time he was our guest, Ernell Lucas was a candidate for sheriff of Milwaukee County. Next week, he gets sworn in. Welcome back and congratulations. Thank you so much, James. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Uh, you made history with your appointments of women as uh, chief deputy in the creation of a job for chief legal and compliance officer, mm -hmm. the first in Wisconsin Sheriff's Office history. Mm -hmm. Why did you go that route? Um, I looked at what had transpired in the past at the Sheriff's Office, uh, James, and quite frankly, felt that we needed to do better. Um, one of the things that I said during the course of the campaign is that, uh, is that we're going to change the culture and change the direction. The purpose for uh, bringing on a chief legal and compliance officer it's for two things, uh, James. One, to ensure that we're doing the right things, meaning those things that are consistent with best practices of other agencies around the country. And then two, that we're doing them right, that we're meeting all ethical, moral, and legal standards in applying um, whatever practices that we're doing. So I felt that that was important, and um, I think that that person is gonna really, really uh, help us move in the direction that we need to go. Let's talk about your top priorities. Mm -hmm. What are they? I, I tell you, one is obviously restoring the honor and trust back to uh, the Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office. Um, you look around the country, law enforcement agencies are at you know, crossroads in terms of um, their relationships with the communities that they serve. You know, I um, want to restore that uh, honor and trust so that, again, uh, communities of color, immigrant uh, communities, and LGBTQ and others feel comfortable with their law enforcement agencies, will report crimes, and will be witnesses to crimes. So that's uh, my first priority. Obviously, we've got to find uh, a way to patrol our parks and our freeways. We've seen multiple incidents along our uh, freeway systems here uh, this year, this past year, as well as unfortunate incidents in our parks. And again, we've got to make it safe so that seniors can go for a walk in a park and young people can go and play. And then um, we've got to obviously um, get the jail um, situation under control, um, whether it be you know, with the medical provider that uh, the county board is making a move on just recently, as well as, again, uh, treating people with uh, dignity and respect. And again, if we can accomplish those things um, coming out the gates, uh, James and I'd be very, um, very pleased with uh, the, the progress and the direction that we're going. Uh, you stated that the $45.5 million budget that you'll be working with is not enough. Mm -hmm. How much money do you need and why isn't that enough? I'm not certain I know the answer. Uh, what I do know is that uh, when you look at uh, the number of incidents that we've had on our freeway systems and the number of deputies able to respond to it. When you look at uh, the incidents in our parks um, and the inability for us to respond to a number of those situations that are handled by uh, the Milwaukee Police Department. And then just recently we saw an unfortunate incident take place in our halls of justice, in our courtroom. Um, James, this community needs more resources in order to do the job to keep Milwaukee County strong and uh, keep Milwaukee County safe. And so I'm going to advocate for whatever resources we can, whether it be through um, uh, the county government, 
public-private partnerships, what have you. But again, um, we've got to do more to um, uh, bring more resources to the sheriff's office in order to do the job that the people expect us to do. Now, the department, unfortunately, has been marred by the death of inmates mm -hmm. and also some uh, other malpractices. Mm -hmm. uh, how, do you, how, how will you address that? It comes down to um, adhering to professional standards. Uh, we say in baseball, James, that we're held to a higher standard, mm -hmm. and uh, we ought to be proud of that. And I feel the same way, too, that law enforcement is a noble profession, and young men and women that are entering in this profession need to know that they are held to a, a high standard by the public that they serve, by the peers that they work with, as well as the uh, rich legacy and tradition that are uh, being passed down to them. So if we can correct that and get uh, people to, uh, again, adhere to those high standards, whether it be our um, sheriff's uh, deputies, whether it be our correctional officers, uh, and or um, our personnel working in the courthouse, if we can get everybody to adhere to that high standard um, at the sheriff's office, we, we can start turning some things around there. Are you staffed properly? Do you need more deputies? You know, um, I'm not going to disparage. Uh, I know the, the, sh uh, the current administration is doing the very best that they can. Um, we've got to get in there, um, myself and the team that I've put in place and uh, those members that are there, and figure out just what it is that we're doing and, and what we can do with what we have, and then uh, figure out uh, what's best for us moving forward. So um, I, 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 I've always ag advocated that uh, we could use more resources uh, but I'm also mindful, too, that resources are not solely the answer as well. Um, you know, my experiences in baseball where, you know, um, in some uh, foreign countries where you call for additional resources, and in one instance in the country of China, for example, uh, 200 young, uh, young uh, security guards came, but they didn't have the experience and knowledge to do what was needed, the task at hand. So resources alone is not the answer, James. We've got to have supervision. We've got to have leadership and uh, the appropriate number of resources, uh, technology, and a number of other things. Um, and I'm going to be the uh, uh, biggest advocate and cheerleader for getting those things here to keep our community safe. Why is trauma such a big issue for you? Well, you know, someone that's a victim of gun violence, uh, I certainly know um, what uh, the impact of trauma, and certainly if it's unaddressed, it's not um, tended to what the effects of it could be. Fortunately for me, you know, I have a strong uh, composition but uh, when you think about the trauma, and not only, I know we talk about the gun violence and the violence in our community, but even if you're just driving down the streets here in Milwaukee County on a day-to-day -day basis and watch the recklessness and the disregard for human life that goes on, many times I've had to pull my car to the side of the road just to get a deep breath because it's just so you know, chaotic out there. Um, our community has suffered from a lot of uh, trauma and uh, uh, stress and uh, as a whole, we've got to find a way to address that, or otherwise we're going to just continue to perpetuate that cycle. Well, hey, I appreciate you coming and join us, and we'll have you back soon. I look forward to it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. After more than four decades here at Milwaukee PBS, producer Liddy Collins is going to retire on January 4th. We asked some of the people who know her best to share their memories. What are you trying to communicate uh, with your art, through your art? I want to enlighten, educate, and entertain. Sometimes art isn't just about a pretty picture. It's, it's okay if it's thought-provoking. Artist Brad Bernard and producer Liddy Collins share that same objective. By educating, entertaining, and enlightening, they each hope to make the world a better place. Liddy's been doing that for 41 years at Milwaukee Public Television. She's worked on a variety of projects, from Tracks Ahead to the Public Policy Forum. But her real passion has been to tell the untold stories of her own community. No, Libby was what we call a type A personality. Said, um, she was That's always life, forceful. You know, she was always expressive. Um, she was no nonsense. She knew what she wanted. Um, she didn't take any guff from anybody. And I think uh, in the early days, she um, she wanted to make sure that. Um, you know, the African-American community was being represented well, was being portrayed well, and, um, and that, you know, things that, weren't ha that were happening that weren't being seen in other media uh, were seen here on, on Channel 10. 
Black Nouveau has been Milwaukee PBS's flagship program for the African-American community for more than three decades. Liddy was one of the show's creators. She was new to the field, and uh, she had been in college and everything. She, she was a cheerleader, coach, and so she was split between that and here. And then she, television won out, I think, because she really got into it. Joe Savage, myself, and Liddy Collins, we were the three who started it back in 19, is it 87 or 88? I'm forgetting, I'm getting old now, I'm forgetting <laughs> when that was, but um, Liddy was someone who was just so always committed to the program, to her community, to wanting to do and to give her best, and so we would work long hours, we had loads of fun, um, just always brainstorming. As a matter of fact, she was the one who came up with the name Black Nouveau. I don't know if you, well, you're old enough. There was a group called Club Nouveau back in the 80s. And we were brainstorming about names one day. And we, somebody said Club Nouveau. And she said, well, what about Black Nouveau? And was like, yeah, new black. But, you know, a new kind of show that was going to deal with the positive aspects of, of our community, something that had not been done to that capacity before. And when she, when she said it, I think it resonated with us so much that we wanted to make sure it was such a powerful program and show, and it was all because you know she came up with that name. She took me into a family. I'm a 28-year-old young African-American male, no prior television experience or background, uh, and I show up here uh, just green for an audition for Black Nouveau, and. Uh, you know, she, she became a mother for me in, in that sense. Uh, she took me under her wing. Uh, she mentored me. She protected me. Sometimes scolded me uh, in her own loving way. Uh, but more so, she invested in me. And uh, she taught me, you know, what I needed to know. I was on the show for about six years. And then I retired and the show went off the air. Then somehow, they were fighting in here and it came back on. So I guess it's because of her that it was back on. In 2006, I joined the team along with Keith Murphy and Faith Colas. It was like walking with someone that had all the knowledge in the world about Black Milwaukee. I have several favorite memories of working with Liddy and they all are around fashion. My makeup, <laughs> She always had something to say about my makeup, and she always wanted me to look glamorous. Well, glamorous really wasn't my thing. It was more comfortable, and I am a signature turtleneck wearer. And she said, Faith, you have got to have a signature piece of jewelry with that turtleneck. And so, as you can see, I'm wearing a signature piece of jewelry, and because of Liddy, my jewelry collection is absolutely unbelievable. <laughs> Welcome to this special edition of Black Nouveau. I'm Liddy Collins. Milwaukee Running Rebels Community Organization serve at-risk youth of our community. They assist them in making better choices, giving them direction, and opening up their world to new opportunities. They seek to help them see the importance of community service. Black Nouveau traveled to New Orleans with the Running Rebels to view our young people as they represented Milwaukee, giving back. We share this with you. Liddy's work in our community has been vast over a number of years. We could always rely on Liddy to tell the community story. Wow, they're really nice. They were so sweet. They seem like the sweetest people on the planet. Um, and when you don't know love, what love looks like, flattery and, and false sweetness looks real and seems real. I really appreciate Liddy because upon discovering uh, some community atrocities like human trafficking, uh, sex trafficking and labor trafficking, we were trying to get the real story out without a lot of sensationalism. She not only documented uh, with speaking with some of the sex workers that were survivors, Liddy even went to different states to document what they were doing to help with 
some of the eradication of sex and human trafficking as well as labor trafficking. Lady, it's been 12 years since you welcomed me into the Channel 10 and 36 family, Black Nouveau, and to the city that is Milwaukee. I hope that we've been more than co-workers because I think we're very good friends and I thank you for your time, your patience, and your love. You're leaving us full time, but you're gonna continue to tell the stories that you find so very important. And for that, we thank you. And here she is, Liddy Collins. How am I gonna think about Black Nouveau without thinking about Liddy Collins? I, I can't do it. After 27 years, you are Black Nouveau. That's what I think. Do you think that way? Uh, no, I always think of the community as Black Nouveau. Mm. Well, you've been active in a lot of things besides Black Nouveau and besides Milwaukee PBS. Are you going to continue to be active in other things? Oh, yes, my sorority, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, will keep me busy. They have already uh, volunteered my services for a uh, podcast they want to do. People always ask when you retire, you look like you have some things to do, but people always ask, aren't you going to take it easy and sit back? Taking easy for me is reading a book for a couple hours, and I'm going to get some reading in there and a little bit of travel. I look at retirement as the next chapter. What do you want to write in your next chapter? Wow, that's hard because the next chapter is freedom, and I've always you know, thought about freedom. Freedom is hard, and this is going to be kind of hard because I'm responsible for this next chapter, so I hope, it, I, hope I make it interesting. Join us next month on February 7th at 7.30 p.m. here on Channel 10. We celebrate black history here on Black Nouveau every month, but we have some special stories you won't want to miss. Remember to check us out on our website, and like us on Facebook. And give us a call at 414-797-3760 and tell us what you would like to see. Our main story next month was suggested by a viewer. Your idea may be next. For Black Nouveau, I'm Joanne Williams. Thanks for watching. <laughs>